Thank you for joining today. Welcome. I am the Executive Director at SV at Home, Regina Celestin Williams, and we're excited to host you for a thoughtful conversation about how design impacts the costs and benefits of affordable housing. Our Policy and Action at Home is a monthly informal discussion convening housers to engage on hot housing topics. Every month we select a topic or current event, bring in an expert or two to give a brief presentation, and then open up the discussion to ask questions, float new ideas, and identify potential areas for shared action. Before we begin, I would like to acknowledge the traditional ancestral unceded territory of the Moekma Ohlone, Ramatish Ohlone, Tamian Nation, and Amat Mutsin, on which we are learning, working, and organizing today. We are committed to honoring and making visible the indigenous people and tribes that were intentionally displaced from their land, who remain here in Silicon Valley and are a part of our community. So with that, I'm going to pass it on to today's moderator, SV at Home's Policy Manager, Allison Singalani. Thank you so much, Regina, and thank you all for joining us on this absolutely beautiful Friday, at least for a few more hours. Um, so just a little bit of housekeeping before we get started. Uh, we do want to ensure that the conversations and relationships here today remain respectful and productive. Uh, so please do be kind and courteous to each other. No rude comments or personal attacks. Um, we encourage asking questions and listening as we learn and engage with each other. Please remember that today's event is focused on the costs and benefits of affordable housing um, and keep questions and chat on topic. Uh, sometimes the chat can get lively. If you find that it's distracting you from the content of the discussion, we encourage you to consider closing the chat, at least temporarily. Um, we do want to let folks know that if a person is disruptive or otherwise violates the, the code of conduct, they may be removed with or without warning. Um, hopefully it doesn't come to that. It generally doesn't. Um, so I'm really excited today to introduce our guest speakers, uh, Kate Conley and Sarah Vaccaro from Architects Fora. Um, Kate is the Architect Principal and Building Excellence Lead. Uh, she's a licensed architect in California, Colorado, and Washington State. Uh, she brings a wealth of experience in sustainable design and technical expertise, cultivated through her tenure with renowned firms like Foster and Partners. Uh, improving equity and justice in the design and engineering professions and expanding um, area of emphasis for Kate, leading her to participate in the AIA Silicon Valley Equity, Diversity and Inclusion Task Force and serve as events directors and next year's chair for the Women in Architecture Committee. Uh, Sarah is the Architect Principal and Equitable Communities Lead. Uh, she's dedicated to leveraging architecture for positive social change. With a decade of experience in the Bay Area, her work spans from educational environments to affordable housing projects. Uh, she respects the responsibility of designing places individuals will call home and is deeply committed to Fora's collaborative uh, approach and restorative process. Together, Kate and Sarah, alongside their colleague Leah, lead Architects Fora, uh, previously known as OJK, uh, striving to create vibrant, equitable, and inclusive spaces that enrich our communities. So in just a few minutes, I'm gonna hand this over to Kate and Sarah, but I wanted to spend just a few minutes setting the table for our conversation today, uh, because we often hear a lot of discussion about the cost of affordable housing. And the truth is costs are high uh, everywhere and for all types of housing, and especially now with rising interest rates increasing the expense of borrowing money. So we talk about high costs and long timelines for affordable housing, and it can be frustrating. So I want to share a little bit of grounding with you. In our area right now, we're seeing affordable housing being built at between $850,000, $950,000 per unit. Uh, those numbers change based on the apartment size and the number of bedrooms. Uh, usually cities contribute about $1 to the cost of local affordable housing um, compared to leveraging four to five dollars of state and federal money and private investment. So that state and federal money and private investment will flow away from us without that critical local funding that is able to close the gap and leverage those other sources of funding. So that local investment is really important. Um, we know from recent analysis that affordable housing is 
just only a little less than 10% more expensive than market rate housing for some really good reasons. Um, those reasons include the timeline for arranging the complex financing for affordable housing, which has gotten shorter with state streamlining, and the additional benefits that affordable housing delivers. So those include things like prevailing wage, a uh, little bit larger units with more bedrooms to serve families, and sometimes the use of space for service delivery as well. So this matters because we've seen some folks recently pitting solutions against each other, pitting affordable housing against other approaches that we know don't deliver the same benefits for the money. Affordable housing also improves the lives of residents by relieving the impossible choices that come with cost burden, like do you pay rent or do you repair the car that just broke down that's your only way to get to work or buy healthy groceries or keep growing children in shoes. Um, affordable housing also helps relieve things like overcrowding, housing instability, and the health, educational, and employment impacts that go along with it, uh, displacement from the community, and eviction. So what we talk about a little less is the spaces themselves. How do we build great spaces for people to live? Uh, kind of that human side of affordable housing. So now I'm going to turn it over to Kate and Sarah to do exactly that. I'm really excited for that. Thank you, Kate and Sarah. Well, hi, everyone. Um, Allison, thank you for that really kind introduction and the great framing for our topic today. Um, we would like to thank you all for inviting us to be Silicon Valley at Home's March Policy and Action presenters. We're big fans and longtime members of SV at Home. So the costs and benefits of affordable housing. Today, we will answer the question, what makes the design of affordable housing unique, both from the design of other types of housing and from the design of other types of buildings? In essence, is affordable housing worth it? Today, we'll explore with you all what we consider to be the four hallmarks unique to the design of affordable homes. These homes are designed with specific resident populations in mind. They celebrate its community context. They are the first line of defense against our housing crisis and the market forces driving it. And they reach a higher echelon of durability, sustainability, connectivity, and accessibility. Next slide, please. The first defining aspect of designing affordable homes is that they're designed for specific populations or groups of residents to a far greater extent than market rate housing. Next. Affordable housing serves a range of lower income households as well as specific vulnerable populations. There are po These are populations who are vulnerable to being rent burdened, i.e. paying more than 30% of their gross household income on rent or vulnerable to being displaced from their housing or populations who are currently experiencing homelessness. This need to serve specific resident groups is often due in part to specific funding sources for affordable housing being tied to serving low-income households, large families, seniors, transitional age youth, adults with intellectual and developmental disabilities, veterans, families, and individuals at risk of experiencing homelessness, or those who have experienced chronic homelessness. So these are, next slide please, these are residents who are critically important to the diversity, health, and thriving of our communities. Yet, the market-driven housing economy does not provide affordable or supportive housing options for them. Oftentimes, we are designing for affordable housing developments that serve multiple special needs populations. Here are a few of our firm's recently completed projects in the populations they serve. I'm working on Roosevelt Park Apartments in San Jose right now for families, transitional age youth, and rapid rehousing. And Sarah just got TCO on Azure Apartments, which is now renamed to Soler Apartments. And that is a combination of permanent supportive housing and low-income housing development as well. So the question we ask ourselves as designers of affordable housing is, how can we best design spaces to support the specific populations who will live there, while also acknowledging a range of needs and preferences in that group? Next. For our firm, we rely on a range of research to inform our design process and design strategies. A few examples of that research is here. We employ trauma-informed design strategies. Research estimates that around 70% of Americans report trauma exposure, and trauma is a nearly universal experience with people with mental health and substance abuse disorders, those living in poverty, those who have experienced violence, and those who have experienced homelessness. Many of the very people who are likely to be served by shelters, supportive housing, and affordable housing. So we take great care to create spaces that support healing and restoration for those who have experienced higher levels of trauma. The, these design principles also create spaces that benefit us all. 
We design for inclusion based on the housing design standards for accessibility and inclusion by the Kelsey to create spaces that serve people with all abilities, allowing them to easily navigate and feel at home. We utilize a design process centered on the human and resident experience, designing through a lens of empathy and improving the quality of life for our future residents, backed by research on how humans experience and interact with the spaces around them. We also engage in a continuum of our own research, starting with community engagement, specifically with future resident populations, working sessions with resident service providers, and our own post-occupancy evaluations of completed and occupied buildings to better inform the next project. If you stay on this slide, Sarah will speak to the trauma-informed design principles. Yeah. Thanks, Kate. I'll walk through a few examples of these research-backed design strategies and how we implement them in our work. Trauma-informed care upholds tenets of providing safety, a sense of control, choice, collaboration, and empowerment to residents and staff. An example of trauma-informed design supporting the sense of control and empowerment is designing spaces that mitigate sensory overload while also allowing for sensory delight. The image on the left shows our unit entry alcoves at Solaire Apartments. By recessing the entry, this allows residents a moment of respite as they transition between the more public corridor space and the privacy of their unit. The change in flooring from hard vinyl plank to softer carpet serves as a tactile experience of a welcoming home experience. The color-coded alcoves by floor allow for easy wayfinding. All these strategies help to mitigate sensory overload as residents transition to coming home. On the right side are examples of the same project providing sensory delight. An amazing, amazingly talented local artist added murals in our courtyard and entry to the building, reflecting local flora and fauna. Every level in the building has views to these murals as residents and staff move throughout their days. Other set strategies of sensory delight include providing views to nature, access to fresh air, quieter spaces for respite, as well as more active spaces for community building. Next slide. Another trauma-informed design principle is to create opp opportunities for visual connection to safety, for safety and calming. We design entry experiences that allow residents to visually see ahead into the space so they can decide if they want to interact with the people that are already in that room or choose to go another path. In the Solaire Apartments plan you see here, um, we have prioritized views from the front desk and staff offices to the lobby, to the front door, into the community room, to the community room kitchen, so that they can keep an eye on these spaces, which in turn allows them to make them more available for residents to use. For residents, the visual connections allow them to see into the space before entering, um, just allowing them to have a, a, a better sense of comfort as they um, move throughout the building. If you'd like to learn more about trauma-informed design principles, I think Somebody already shared in the chat, uh, chat box a great resource, and we'll provide those links after. But there's a, a lot of up and coming research and data being collected on these principles. Next slide. As Kate mentioned, we are a committed organization to upholding and designing to the housing design standards for accessibility and inclusion by the Kelsey. The worksheet guide here on the left shows the impact areas, additional benefits, and level of design available for each element of the standard. An example of inclusive and universal design strategies includes creating natural, integrated, easy to understand wayfinding, wayfinding signage and decor that is usable for people of all abilities. The wayfinding graphic on the right for our Mitchell Park Place project integrates color coding and large numerical signage for residents. In addition, the number of vertical boards adjacent to that correspond with the floor number, providing a tactile wayfinding option in addition to visual cues. Next slide. When designing for people and residents of all abilities, it's important to provide different sensory experiences. Spaces that are quiet, lower light levels, less use of pattern and color can be sensory calming spaces. Spaces with more activity, visual interests can be sensory rich experiences and allow residents options to choose and use the space that best aligns with their needs. In Mitchell Park Place, we are able to provide a variety of sensory calming and stimulating spaces, including a sensory garden outside that has a range of tactile, smell, sound, and movement experiences, including the labyrinth and the floor ground and a swing beyond. If you'd like to learn more about the Kelsey and Housing Design Standard for Accessibility and Inclusion, we'll provide some resources and references there as well. Next slide. 
In our human experience design approach, we create personas to represent a range of future residents, then consider the lived experience of those resident personas in our design process, allowing us to design with understanding and empathy. This process starts with asking who are the people who will live and work at Capitola 38th Avenue, for example, then asking questions to better understand each person's persona's typical day. Consider how that person will move, how their day will start, how they'll move throughout the site, what will be their favorite outdoor space to use. Next slide. We couple our human experience design research um, with these, with this analysis, and then look for opportunities to incorporate design features that will support those experiences. For example, when considering a couple living in a one bedroom apartment where demographic research shows that one person may work from home and need a home office, we can provide flexibility in the unit layout to accommodate a desk. At a site organization level, we map a day in the life of a resident persona moving across the site. The exercise can reveal opportunities to improve adjacencies between spaces, reinforce direct pathway connections, or simply yet, uh, or simple yet important amenities like parking for a wagon near the parking lot so residents have an easy way to bring their groceries home from the car. The goal of layering human experience design process into our projects is to find more meaningful ways to improve the design of a unit, a home, a common area, circulation, and site organization to better support the future residents, future resident populations who will call this project home. Next slide. Continuing on to the topic of common areas or amenity spaces, our projects have community rooms and outdoor spaces for people to gather and entertain outside of their units. While similar types of spaces are included in market rate multifamily housing developments as well, in affordable housing, there, we also couple these spaces with resident service providers who provide programming to bring these spaces to life. Um, these are programs that support community building, life skills training, after school programs, and financial stability. More, more successful common areas remain flexible while also providing furniture and specific uses for the different areas, oftentimes co-locating or layering these spaces and uses to add to a vibrant community feeling. The common area on the left provides dedicated computer workstations along the wall, as well as comfortable seating areas and direct connection to the exterior courtyards beyond. Next slide. In our large family developments, it's important to design safe spaces for younger children to play and other age appropriate spaces for school age children to hang out, all allowing parents to places for the, uh, all allowing parents to have clear visual connections to those spaces for supervision. For our Woodside Road project in Redwood City, the building wraps around a multi-level exterior courtyard with the laundry room overlooking the playground and the community room opening up to a quiet or outdoor space. Based on input from the resident services staff early in our design process, we were able to move the computer lab and meeting rooms down to the first floor adjacent to the staff offices so that they could easily supervise those spaces and in turn keep them more open and available to the residents. Next slide. For many of our affordable housing projects, there are a number of resident service provider organizations supporting the residents, providing case management, access to health care, employment opportunities, life skills, and financial support training. These service providers are typically on site with offices and meet with residents regularly. In permanent supportive housing for residents transitioning out of homelessness or other special needs populations, these residential service providers are critically important to supporting residents through the transition of being becoming housed and ultimately staying stably housed. The list on the left here are four organizations supporting our residents at IMEC Village in downtown San Jose. The plan on the right shows a suite of property management and resident services offices adjacent to the lobby and community room of another San Jose project. The design of these spaces allowing the service providers um, to critically to provide these critically needed um, support services <laughs> um, while also ensuring their safety and ability uh, to provide the best care to the residents. Next slide. Pass it back to you, Kate. Great. Yeah. Affordable housing at its best is also designed to reflect the community it serves and celebrate the unique place where it's located. Next. Our team dives deep into history and culture to create buildings that celebrate their place. 
finding the community context of each new project requires in-depth research into the history, the demographics, geography, and culture. For a recent project in Redwood City, we partnered with a firm called Determined by Design to generate design concepts based on local history of the different indigenous and migrant groups who had occupied our site and its surroundings. Our goal is to understand who will live in these homes, who lives in the area, the history of this place, and how we can celebrate all of those aspects in the design. Because a place that better reflects and responds to its context will be better accepted, loved, protected, and invested in. Next. We also actually ask the community their opinion. We believe that design is better with diverse perspectives at the table. In designing affordable homes, we make space for thoughtful conversations and create meaningful activities so that community members and future residents can share authorship over new development. We engage the community early for multiple reasons. We wanna learn their values and priorities and let those inform our design. We wanna build relationships and a support base for the project. And we wanna help the future residents of affordable homes be better understood in their community. Our goal is to incorporate some level of community engagement into our design process for all of our projects, even if streamlining legislation allows for us to bypass this step. A client of ours has termed this friendly SB 35, patent pending. Uh, we all understand that we're tackling a housing crisis. So of course our goal is always to get quality housing built faster, but never at the expense of involving the communities where we're building that housing. Next. What we've learned is that when we co-create places with the community, we share that sense of ownership and pride over the resulting design. And we know that designs that are loved last. After our building is complete, the goal is that all the engagement, research, and intentions that went into the design of the building actually create a place that allows for healing, restoration, and community building among the new residents, staff, and surrounding neighborhood. These are some photos from a recent community building event we hosted at Aya Maisie Village about 18 months after the residents had moved in. Not only did our team get to connect with some of the staff, residents, and their cute pups too, and create some sweet potted plants to decorate their homes and offices, we also had a chance to hear their really invaluable feedback on how the building was working for them and identified some near and long-term improvements to help it work even better in the future. Next, Sarah. The extent of the housing crisis coupled with limited land resources available in the Bay Area drives our need for higher density developments and in turn is a key design driver overall. Next slide. I don't have to tell this group twice. Um, I think we're all pretty aware that we've been underproducing housing for decades, leaving an enormous deficit in homes available compared to the population demand in the United States. Some estimates show that America is short around 3.2 million homes. Next slide. And as we all know, there are not a lot of sites available for development in Silicon Valley specifically. When a property does become available to redevelop for housing, we need to make the most of it. As you can imagine, the nice rectangular, flat, ideally located sites for development are quickly snatched up for market rate housing developments typically leaving what we affectionately or begrudgingly call the leftover sites for affordable housing developments. These are three of our current project sites for affordable housing. They are typically very odd shaped properties, oftentimes directly adjacent to freeways and or train tracks. And all of these factors add complexity and additional mitigation me measures needed to make these plots of land suitable for people to live on. For example, the site in the middle is roughly 20 feet from Highway 87 on the west property line. The acoustical rating required for the windows and walls and systems facing the highway is three times that what a typical building would require. That drives up cost of construction, not to mention impacts the quality of those units. The site on the far left is a very odd shaped footprint with lots of jogs. This requires innovative structural solutions and creative floor plan layouts to make sites like this work. Next slide. Our challenge as designers is to evaluate how many homes we can accommodate on the site within the constraints of the zoning code in a cost-effective manner so that the project is competitive for financing and to create a quality place for people to call home. This is an example of three fit studies for a group of sites in Santa Barbara, evaluating a different number of housing units in each different housing typologies in each and how they could fit in with the surrounding neighborhood context. 
While creating as many new homes and different housing options for our communities is a core value and goal, we do not sacrifice the need to provide quality living spaces that support a thriving community culture. Next slide. All of this to set the stage for the main question we often hear. If it's affordable housing, why does it cost so much? And that kind of comes down to a couple of competing interests. Um, there are a few different forces at play here. First, affordable housing is financed through government subsidies at the federal, state, and local levels. All of these have unique sets of requirements that come with them. They require minimum sizes of units and mix of unit types, one bedrooms, two bedrooms, three bedrooms, et cetera. They require common areas and certain percentages of the units to be fully accessible to people of different abilities. They require a minimum of support spaces to be included in the development. They require higher thresholds for quality of construction than other project types. And there are often labor requirements for prevailing wages, diversified the workforce, et cetera. Finally, they are required to they are required, they require the housing to maintain maintain affordability rental rates for residents for a minimum of 55 years. These are really good requirements to create quality, safe, just housing and employment opportunities, and they come at a higher cost. On the other side of this equation, these funding streams are extremely competitive and projects that keep their costs per unit as low as possible are more competitive to receive funding awards. That requires us to get really creative. We need to maximize the units to provide a cost competitive um, per unit rate. The units need to be an efficient size while also meeting greater clearance requirements for accessibility. The need for resident support services on site is real. We talked about that already and requires additional space within the building. We also need higher levels of safety and security oftentimes in our projects. Higher density buildings require more complicated construction types and contractors with skilled labor workforces. Investment in durable and quality materials is key upfront as, as it helps to reduce the cost, the long-term costs for maintenance operation and future renovations, all of which helps to ensure the projects can maintain affordable rental rates for 55 years and a balanced budget. So in summary, there's a high bar set for how affordable housing is to be designed and construction, which drives up the construction costs, as well as a need to be cost effective as possible for the project to be awarded its funding. Next slide. These next few slides touch on a few of the most commonly asked questions that we hear about why multifamily housing looks the way it does. First, why is it so tall? This one's pretty simple. We have limited land and we have a need for more homes, which requires that we our buildings must be taller. The model shown here is for Roosevelt Park Apartments, which sits on a third of an acre and will provide 80 new homes. That's a density of 266 dwelling units per acre. In addition to providing 80 homes, this building will have a full commercial floor, parking on two levels, all to meet the urban village zoning requirements. When we get into densities like this, it requires nine stories. Um, it requires concrete construction types to meet the building code and provide a cost-effective solution to providing this many homes on this size of a site. Next slide. What, why does the ground floor look like a concrete bunker? Um, <laughs> the short answer is parking. Uh, parking ratios, numbers of stalls, where the parking goes, these are always contentious issues on our projects. Parking that lives within a building is required to be enclosed in a higher, safer construction type, typically concrete. Parking also typically needs to go on the ground floor for ease of access. Our affordable housing projects typically cannot finance underground parking structures. Um, and that's why the ground floor often looks like a concrete bunker to accommodate the number of parking spaces required to keep um, and required as well as to keep them separated from the residential units. Our challenge as designers is to accommodate these requirements while still creating welcoming and active street frontages that support a pleasant human scaled experience. Pass it to Kate. Thanks, yeah, we're just gonna keep going with these questions. They're like the questions our mother-in-laws mother, mother -in -laws ask us, I feel like. So the next one is, why is it so boxy? Um, if you wouldn't mind going to the next slide. Every site we get for affordable housing development is precious. So ma we maximize the number of units we can get on the site, period. And we build them as efficiently as possible by stacking the same type of unit on top of each other all the way up the building. 
As you can imagine, stacking up a bunch of the same size boxes results in a pretty boxy looking building overall. This is a perfect example of those cost-based trade-offs we make during design. We could put more of our budget into articulating the facade and roof lines to create unique building forms that look less boxy, but the trade-offs are typically fewer units or smaller units to make that happen, which isn't great for the, units who the residents who actually live in those dwelling units. And it also means less budget to go into other more impactful design elements, like high performance wall assemblies or visually interesting cladding materials. It could even compromise the amount of budget and space available for interior on-site amenity spaces that actually serve the resident populations who live in the building. Historically, the solution to the boxy building problem, as we call it, was applied ornamentation, like trims and cornices to make the buildings more visually interesting. Today, the trend is to introduce breaks in the building mass to create visual interest. Many objective standards, which we'll touch on in a bit, also require these pushes and pulls to break up the facade, which further reinforces that blocky modern apartment building aesthetic. So next, um, why are there so many windows? This question is the little sister of why is it so boxy? Uh, when the average person thinks of an apartment building, they think of this kind of relentless grid of windows that can add the building as a certain bulk. And the answer is it's because there are a lot of rooms and they're all competing for their own window space on the exterior wall. Plan on the right shows all the rooms behind each of the windows shown in the photo. Each bedroom is required to have a window to the outside and living rooms while they don't technically require one. Also, I think we can agree definitely benefit from a window as well. And in our typical unit plans, the living room window also lends light to the kitchen behind it. And the structure and ventilation between those windows also generally wants to line up vertically to work efficiently and have all the required clearances. You wouldn't want your bathroom exhaust smells floating back in through your bedroom window, right? So you get locked into that typical grid pattern. There's sometimes a bit of staggering you can do like we did on the building on the previous slide, but that adds complexity, which adds, you guessed it, cost. So we tend to do this judiciously and really only on the highly visible facades. Next slide. Uh, do the residents have any privacy? Uh, sometimes when we're working on one of those awkwardly shaped sites Sarah mentioned, we'll end up with some pretty tight courtyards. And so we need to get creative about how we maintain our residents' privacy. We'll introduce angled fin walls like the ones you see here, or we'll make sure to offset or stagger windows that face each other so no one's view is of someone else's apartment window. Many cities also require us to actually do view studies from the apartments in our proposed development to the homes surrounding them too. And inside the building, we're continuously refining the way our walls are built to provide good acoustic separation between units. And that's through a combination of code requirements, performance testing, and making sure that we have acousticians on the design team. Next slide. This is my favorite one. Why are all new buildings covered in rectangles? You're talking about what we refer to in our industry as a rain screen. These panels are, yes, usually rectangular, um, and they get attached to the building with um, metal pieces that create an air gap behind it. The system can help us create a building envelope with better thermal performance, which reduces the amount of energy then needed to heat and cool the building. It also provides a visual contrast to stucco. Stucco or cement plaster is the least expensive yet wonderfully fire resistant way to clad a multifamily apartment building but most cities in the Bay Area require more than one exterior material to be used on the building for visual interest, which in all honesty, that was probably created mostly in response to the building industry's deep love affair with stucco. So rain screens are a great way and relatively cost efficient and high performance way to introduce variety to the facade. In this picture of Lee Avenue Senior Apartments, the stair tower and back buildings are stucco while the volume on the corner is clad in a rain screen system. Next slide. Why do they all look the same? We feel you on this one. <laughs> as much as we strive for each and every one of our buildings to be a unique reflection of place, you can see we're playing by a lot of rules and very practical design constraints already. And then another set of rules to layer on top of that are the objective standards or form-based codes, which many Bay Area cities have adopted in response to ministerial or streamlining requirements, especially for affordable housing developments. We are actually big fans of objective standards because they are a benefit in terms of expediting approvals and because they create a clear set of rules for us to play by when we're working with our friends at the planning department to get our projects entitled quickly. But we do agree that these standards or the resulting designs 
if they don't respond to the context of the place and the people of that community, then they can lead to a homogeneous looking end result. This is a big reason why we take the time to do community engagement and understand who and where we're designing for. And market rate developments are a for sale product, so they can fall victim to the assembly lineization of design that make take the letter of standards like this and simply move on. Sarah. Thanks, Kate. I know we're, we've been going for a while. Silicon Valley home team, do you want us to pause here? We just have a handful more slides or we can pause. Sarah, no, I think you're just fine. Um, really enjoying it. Keep on going. We'll wrap up in the next few. Um, wanted to close with a few notes about how affordable housing design is durable, sustainable, connected, and accessible. Next slide. We employ a range of strategies to create high quality and durable buildings. Remember, our clients will own and operate these buildings for 55 years, ensuring affordable rental rates to the residents. This means the maintenance and operational costs need to be balanced with lower rental income and all work out to a balanced budget in the end. Examples of these durability strategies include specifying exterior materials that have integral color and don't require being repainted every few years, simply cleaned. On the interior, we specify durable flooring materials that are easy to maintain and repair or replace if they get damaged. Simple but impactful strategies like installing wood trim or corner guards along corner corridor corners that protect the walls from getting dinged up help the build, building look nicer in the long term and are much easier to replace than redoing wall finish. Next slide. Affordable housing design is sustainable and resilient. Our nonprofit housing developer clients own and operate these buildings for the long term. They deeply care about the residents and providing affordable housing solutions, which includes keeping utility costs at a reasonable rate. For this reason, we invest in energy efficient building envelopes, as well as building systems, such as heating and cooling, lighting, and efficient plumbing to reduce energy utility costs for residents. We acknowledge these buildings are for our residents' home. Uh, they are the place of refuge in the event of a natural disaster. And it's becoming ever more apparent that we need to provide layers of resiliency measures in our buildings to support extended power outages. Our designs include maximizing PV energy generation on roofs and over parking, um, so that and then that can be that energy can be stored in backup battery systems to supplement pricing during peak demand times and provide critical backup power for extended power outages. Next slide. Affordable housing design is connected and transit oriented. Our clients and design teams are passionate about improving the environment around affordable housing for residents and the broader community. We invest in creating walkable and bikeable communities by building housing near existing or planned public transportation options, as well as amenities like grocery stores, schools, retail. Housing that is well connected and transit oriented is less dependent on vehicles, which reduces those costly parking requirements we were talking about before, and provides for a lovely human-centered quality of life. Next slide. Finally, affordable housing design is accessible for all abilities. Uh, our housing receives public funding and serves a wide range of people and is required to meet accessibility needs for people with different mobility and communication abilities. Inside the units, this means providing enough clearances at appliances, around doors, around furniture to maneuver if somebody's wheelchair bound. In a building, it's providing elevator access to all floors and common areas, as well as tactile signage and audible warnings for those with visual impairments or who are hard of hearing. In our practice, we include a special focus on incorporating inclusive and universal design strategies so people of all abilities can thrive. Oftentimes, these are low cost strategies that just require a thoughtful design process, such as clear wayfinding and considering different sensory experiences in a space. Pass to you, Kate. Thanks. So to summarize, what makes affordable housing design so different from the design of other housing types like it? It centers around people who will live and work there. It reflects its community context and supports community building. It creatively responds to the need for more homes while doing so as cost effectively as possible. And it's durable, sustainable, connected and accessible for all. 
So thank you everyone for attending our session today. We know that was a lot of information. And if you couldn't absorb all those details, we've got your back. This presentation is being recorded and we're happy to send out the slides as well. Um, Allison, I believe we're gonna open it up for Q&A now, right? Yes, thanks so much. So um, folks, if you have questions that have come up during the presentation, please, please uh, feel free to drop those in the chat. Um, Kate and Sarah, thank you for such a, a fascinating presentation. It's it's really interesting to see how much thought uh, goes into the design of, of these buildings and and making them right for both the community and the, the residents. So can you tell me a little bit about what drew you to work in the design of affordable housing? It seems like there's a lot of, of challenges and, and solving sticky problems. Absolutely. Yeah, I, I can Go jump for there. first. Um, about uh, 10 years into my career, I'd been working in the education public school world for a long time and really enjoyed, enjoyed that work. Um, but at the same time, I was starting to learn more about the housing and homelessness crisis, particularly in the Bay Area, um, and working with organizations that were coming up with really creative and compassionate solutions to supporting people that were going through homelessness. Um, and just learning more about our responsibility as architects, our role in creating uh, housing opportunities for all people. And that drew me to um, finding a firm that was working in the affordable housing realm. I basically knocked down the door to work with OJK, it's now Fora. Um, and, and I'm so glad it's a really uh, collaborative space, a very compassionate, empathetic space. And um, when we get to interact with our residents that are living in our projects, it's highly rewarding to hear their personal stories um, and just see the, the impact of, of these buildings. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. I actually uh, started my career working on affordable housing developments in Ventura County in Southern California. And then when I moved up to the Bay Area, worked more on student housing, residence halls, dormitories, things like that. And I, I went on a flight of fancy and worked for a very fancy architecture firm that did very fancy flagship Apple stores all over the country. And my frequent kind of refrain was, do you know how many families we could house, house for the budget of this retail project? And so when Sarah you know, had this opportunity to take over for, uh, ownership of a firm that was doing affordable housing design, it just sort of felt like this easy yes, this easy click kind of back to my roots as an architect. and back to this value that I knew I'd always held deeply, even though I was at the time practicing, you know, much higher end uh, uh, design. So I think it just, it felt, it felt right. And I think that's what continues to, to draw us back to affordable housing is just understanding that we're meeting a really deep community need. That's fantastic. Thank you so much. Um, I was, I, I love the idea of affordable housing really reflecting and responding to the community, both around mm. and within it. Uh, so given that you are working with so many constraints, um, including objective standards that can lead to that kind of that feeling of sameness under some circumstances across both affordable and market rate development, can you tell us a little bit about how you create those design elements to to reflect the community? Yeah, absolutely. Um the project that really kicked off our deep, deep interest in community engagement was Mitchell Park Place. It's actually the one behind me, this one in Palo Alto. And, um, you know, we had a very activated group of neighbors that were across the street from that project in the Green Meadow neighborhood. It's a beautiful Eichler mid-century historic neighborhood um, immediately across the street from this project. And they were, as many neighbors are when they hear an affordable housing development is coming to their neck of the woods, concerned and showed up in force to our community engagement meetings. And part of that initial listening process that we do is we'll, we'll do a visual preference survey of the group who has arrived and we were showing them a lot of contemporary apartment buildings around town in Palo Alto, trying to get their sense of which ones they liked and which one they didn't. And they basically said, we don't like any of these. We like our mid-century homes. We think that's a really important aesthetic for this community. And I was like, let's do a four-story mid-century apartment building then. Like it was, it was such an easy yes when they expressed that clear preference and we took the time to listen. So an objective standard will say something like, you need to have pushes and pulls in the facade. You need to have a very good roof line. And we're like, okay, let's do that in a mid-century way. Let's have these you know, sloping roof lines and the exposed beam ends, vertical siding and Eichler colors, wood paneling, you know, things that reflect the values that that community very clearly expressed to us in a way that still meets the letter of the objective standards. 
So there is room as a designer to still, you know, manipulate and um, express the design intent of the community and of our own practice and of our clients um, and still meet the letter of those objective standards and all of the other design constraints we have on us um, in, a, in, a, in a way that I feel is really cohesive and successful. I'll let you all judge once it's completed. <laughs> awesome. That's a great example. I look forward to seeing that one. Um, I was also really interested in what you had to say about quality and durability of materials and finishes, because sometimes I think we tend to think of affordable housing as needing to cut corners to pencil out. Uh, but in fact, some of the cost effectiveness comes from investing in these aspects that will allow the development um, to be sustainable and continue to work well for many years without a lot of additional investment. So can you give us some examples of how that's shown up in some of your recent design work? Yeah, and it, it's a really, it's a fine line because durable materials can often very easily slide into a, a more institutional feel and less homey. And so it's really, it's being very intentional about finding ways to develop the interior design of a space, layer in furniture and art that gives it a sense of home and makes it feel welcoming, um, makes it feel like somebody cares to design the space for these residents. And um, in turn, that generally inspires the residents to take care of the space more carefully to, um, to, to not, to not um, damage things as much. And so um, by investing a little bit more in the quality and character of the space, it inspires people to take care of it and protect it better, which increases the long-term durability um, and just quality of the space. I think Kate, did you have? Yeah, it? yeah, absolutely. We, I mean, it, it'll be it'll be a decision like, do you use wood paneling on an exterior, or do you use a very convincing wood look aluminum panel that will is UV resistant, will look great for the next you know twenty twenty five years, and at the end of its life is recyclable. So it, it's really like yes, that aluminum paneling is going to cost a little bit more on day one, but our clients are very savvy and understand that this building is something they're going to be maintaining and protecting for a long time. So they'll make that incremental investment in the greener and more durable product in order to meet the rest of the project goals. Awesome. Thank you. Um, we had a question from the chat. In addition to why is it so tall? Can we ask because of the housing crisis, why isn't it taller? <laughs> Great question, Alex. <laughs> um, thankfully, in the past few years, we've had the amazing benefit of state density bonuses mm -hmm. with, that include height increases that do allow us to push our buildings up taller than typical zoning allows, zoning height allowances. Um, and so that has increased our ability to go taller. Um, you have to weigh that with the construction cost efficiencies. I think we talked about that before. There's kind of a, a threshold um, of four stories of residential over one story of concrete. That's a really common um, height and density for our affordable housing projects because it allows you to build the residential levels out of un, uh, out of wood construction, which is cost effective and quick. Um, once you go up taller than that, getting into the six, seven, eight, nine stories, it transitions to different construction types that are more costly, which can pencil out um, if you have the density, the number of units to to make that work out. Um, so uh, yes, it just all comes down to the to the numbers game and how how best to set the project up for financial success. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Awesome. So I believe you mentioned that some of your spaces have have commercial space on the ground floor. Um, can you talk a little bit about some of the challenges around that and um, and how that uh, how that impacts the design of or or impacts the development itself? Yeah, absolutely. We have several mixed use projects and often the, the sites we get our hands on have some level of mixed use requirement. Uh, Lee Avenue has medical office suites on the ground floor. Gish Avenue has a 7-Eleven on the ground floor, which I think is actually kind of cool. Um, and 
we have a project um, that's under development in San Antonio that's going to have kind of a, a cafe and, and sundry store on the ground floor that's meeting Palo Alto's um, retail requirement for a mixed use zone. Um, it definitely means actually more parking is one of the hardest things to accommodate because you have to calculate the parking for that commercial component separately from the residential parking requirements. And you can't use all of our little affordable housing legislative tricks that we have to, you know, reduce parking to an appropriate level for affordable housing on the commercial pieces. So Mitchell Park, for example, has 11 commercial parking spaces and technically has a zero requirement for parking for the residential. So just adding that little bit of commercial component can actually throw off that calculation in a big way. And I know for our clients, I don't want to speak for all of them, but it can actually make it tricky from a financing standpoint and just getting a tenant in a space that is that small. Um, you know, there's not easy ways to like run a cafe out of the ground floor of a, of a residential building. So um, it sounds great. It sounds like this wonderful, like incorporated neighborhood. Everyone's going to have these live work buildings everywhere, but the financing structures behind them don't really support that vision. So we often advocate for, think of it like a mixed use block, like housing, retail, housing, retail, rather than housing on top, retail on the ground, because that's a lot more financeable and entitleable model. We did, we did get very lucky on Roosevelt Park Apartments, which is under construction right now, that they were able to make that financing work. And this one's even more complicated. The commercial space is on the ninth floor. Mm -hmm. The housing is below and then the parking on the ground floors. Um, and that gets really complicated because you need to have separate vertical circulation elevator stairs that bring people up to the ninth floor commercial separate, space. Separate trash chutes. Stru separate trash chutes. <laughs> All of it's um, separated. So it adds complexity, but it, to, to your point, it, it adds a lot of vibrancy to a project. So where we are able to integrate some amount of commercial or mixed use components, um, we do believe that, that that makes for a richer community culture around our housing. Awesome, thank you. Um, is Architects Fora doing any work with Mass Timber yet? We would love to. We were literally just talking about Mass Timber an hour ago, I'm not even joking. Um, <laughs> That one is another one where you have to be at the right threshold of height and size to make it work out financing wise. It's actually kind of more competitive with concrete models than like type 5A. So it's not a great replacement for that like four over one ratio that Sarah was talking about. It really pencils out better. We've heard when you get into the taller building types. Um, and we have not had many projects that are in zones that will let us go that tall or in areas that have a demand for that many units on one site. That said, we would love to work on a mass timber building. So call us if you've got one. <laughs> awesome. Have you designed any spaces for licensed childcare in developments? Yes, I have one that's about to start construction right now. Um, we actually partnered with Catalyze SV a year ago to present on um, designing for women and children. And that's a, that's a a passion area of ours being a woman-led organization. Um, so we have a project, it's called Grace Village, uh, partnering with a local nonprofit organization called City Team. Um, they have a residential support service um, space for women. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, it's a residential living environment for women who are uh, transitioning out of homelessness or recovering from substance abuse or uh, exiting out of incarceration. Um, and it's, it's a village of apartment buildings. And what they need is the support services spaces that will couple with those um, apartment buildings to provide a holistic approach to caring for, for these women and children. That building will have classroom spaces for career training, life skills training, um, just community building. It will have a child care center, licensed child care center for young children who live on site. Um, and so that will, I think, provide for about 25 children to be cared for at a time. It has indoor spaces as well as the corresponding outdoor spaces dedicated for them. And then the project also has a space, a hangout space and tutoring area for school-aged children as well. So really, really fun project, excited that it's finally underway. That's awesome. This is so exciting. Thank you both so much, um, Kate and Sarah, for sharing with us uh, more about all the decisions that go into 
um, affordable housing and all the benefits that it delivers to the community. I really appreciate that. So um, we'll have someone on our team uh, drop a little link in the chat to learn more about Architects Fora's teamwork. Uh, team and work. Uh, and we're going to segue into a little bit of wrapping up here. So um, you've heard a lot today about the value of affordable housing and some of the benefits that it delivers both to residents and our, our communities. So right now in San Jose, our affordable housing pipeline, um, the, de the developments that are ready to go, um, those are at risk. We know that right now we have at least 13 developments representing 1,527 new affordable homes that are not receiving funds from the city uh, to close that last financing gap and allow them to move forward. Uh, right now, the city of San Jose is working on its budget for the coming year. Uh, and some folks on the city council believe that we should shift all of the city's affordable housing funds to interim emergency shelter. So it's important to understand that if we do that, not only will we not get the permanent affordable housing that we so desperately need, uh, but we will create an environment of uncertainty for developers who won't be able uh, to stick around to see if the money comes back someday. They will have to go to other places where local funds do exist to help close that financing gap. So we really run the risk of losing all the money in San Jose that we have to build affordable housing. Uh, the city has invested really heavily in interim emergency shelters and needs to find a source of funding uh, to cover the substantial ongoing operating costs that come with that, but not one that diverts funding away from the affordable housing that we need so badly. Uh, so if you believe that we need to invest in permanent affordable housing in San Jose as a critical part of the response uh, to both unsheltered homelessness and the housing needs of the city's other low-income families and individuals, um, here is our ask, get involved in the City of San Jose's budget process. Uh, this past Tuesday, Council provided direction to the City Manager about what they would like to see in a proposed budget uh, and what they need more information on to be able to make the tough decisions about how to allocate resources. Uh, we'll see the City Manager's proposed budget on May 1st, and then there will be a series of public meetings uh, as Council considers that proposal and potential alternatives. So we will all have the chance to weigh in on what the final budget will look like uh, between May 1st and the time the budget is adopted on June 12th. So um, when we send the recording of this event to you, Keep an eye out for it. This is really important. We're also going to send you talking points, a call script, a sample letter, and contact information for council members. They need to hear from each of us that preserving funds for permanent affordable housing uh, is really critical to meeting the needs of San Jose's residents. So please make sure you're keeping an eye out for that email. And, and thank you for, for getting involved and, and being engaged in this. Um, so now I'm going to pass it on to our housing planning and production associate. Uh, Manuel, uh, to share a little bit about membership with SV at Home. Hey, everyone. So at SV at Home, we believe everyone deserves a safe, stable home. Uh, and if you do too, we invite you to join us as a member. So when you join SV at Home together, we can build and sustain movement for affordable housing because we are stronger together. Uh, especially, uh, well, we're stronger together than we can ever be in isolation. So because you are so important to us, we want membership to be open and accessible to everyone. So there's not a minimum cost to join. Uh, feel free to pay whatever you can, uh, really pay what you believe our work is worth. Uh, your membership helps support our work, including programs like Policy in Action, which you witnessed today. Uh, and you can find the link to join us in, in the chat, which Emily should be putting in our chat now. Um, <laughs> Together, we can work towards solving the Bay Area's housing crisis, and I really do hope that you will consider joining SV at Home as a member. So, thank you. <laughs>